if you will. We'll get started this morning. We're going to come here now to a new chapter, Romans chapter 7. And uh, this morning, we're just going to kind of introduce the chapter to us, and uh, then uh, we'll uh, dive into the, into the details uh, next week, but uh, just do an inter- introduction and to it and so forth. So, change seats, huh? Okay, you're on the gray side for a change? All right. Okay. <laughs> hey, that's okay. I'm always used to bending this way. So the, the right hand of the fellowship right over here, right? So <laughs> anyway, yeah, we were just talking about the weather. You know, it's, the rain hits and the desert rats go away. They don't come out. <laughs> it's like, oh, come on, it's okay. So... All right, Romans chapter 7, if you will. We're going to start a new chapter again this morning. We're going to introduce it, and uh, then uh, as we continue uh, moving through these identification truths and uh, that uh, we have now in, that we now have in Christ, and as we move through the, 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 this section, again, a, a majority of uh, believers stop after they get through the end of Romans 5. And uh, I don't understand quite the reason is, except then they jump to chapter 12 and want to start doing service. And uh, you can't do service if you don't know who you are and what you have. And that's so we kind of slow roll through here. I was looking, we are, this is lesson 60 and we're only in Romans 7. So, you know, <laughs> we're not even halfway through the book yet. And uh, we're, but... Uh, Anyway, Romans 7, if you just read verse 1 here. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. As we come into Romans 7 now, Romans 6, we learned about our position in Christ. We learned that we are dead to, Christ, dead to sin and alive unto God. And now we're going to come into 7, and we're going to, so we saw our position uh, we uh, on Monday nights with the with the young folks there. Uh, I they they do a lot of softball play. So we learn to play third base. We learned who we are. Now in seven, we're going to learn our program. We're going to see that we're dead to the law, but alive in Christ Jesus. So we're gonna. So we're now we're going to learn the program. So when we go play third base, we're not playing according to football rules. We're playing according to softball rules. We're in the right program. And then in chapter 8, we're going to learn that we have a, we have a new power source on board. That uh, really now that we understand that we're dead to sin and that we're dead to the law, now we're going to learn that we're dead to that flesh and we're alive unto God, but we're alive unto God through the power and the working of the Holy Spirit in our inner man. So now we have a new power center instead of... Uh, just kind of trying to get there ourselves. Now the Spirit works through the Word, so we've got His Word working and doing and going and so forth. So we want to pay attention here as we introduce chapter 7 because it has to do with this new program that the believer is to operate under and uh, this new operating system called grace. Uh, My phone the other day updated. I, I got one of those dreaded apples. I got talked into it. And, I, you know, I was always a Samsung. Everything was good. Learned the Apple, you know, and it's fine. But it, it, it got a new operating system. It updated the OS. And I'm like, OS, what is that? You know, then, you know, okay, operating. You know, I ask my kids, they tell me. So operating, well, now we're in a new operating system. And we need to learn that. We need to pay attention to how those dynamics work now in us. Verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Notice something. The law has what? Dominion, but as long as the man lives. Verse 2. For the, law, for, for the woman hath, uh, which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if... While her husband liveth, she, she be married to another man. She shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, 
Now, notice in my pat in my Bible, in my I have the dominion underline and the liveth underline and the dead and the loosed, because it's he's using the law as a principle here of hey, you're dead to the law, then you're what? You're loosed from the law, because wherefore, verse four, my bre- wherefore my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Wherefore, what are we? We're dead to the law, aren't we? See that? Again, how, how do we know that we're dead to the law? Verse 4 just told you that. So just as you have that assurance of your sins forgiven, and just as you have that assurance of the word of God that you are dead to sin, guess what now you are? Dead to the law. And again, we, how do we know, how do we have the assurance? It has to do with the fact that that's what the ver- Word of God says. How do we have the assurance of heaven? Well, the verses say so. Uh, again, how do we have the assurance here? I, I, by the way, chapter 6, we're dead to sin. Our relationship to sin is dead. Sin didn't die. Our relationship to it. The law doesn't die. It didn't go away. But our relationship to it was taken care of. Okay? Verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Um, in, In the theology game, and they call... You, they call people who follow the, this passage antinomianism, okay? And it, anti, against, nomian, the law, against the law. And uh, what they say is that this is a doctrine according to which Christians are freed by grace from the necessity of obeying the Mosaic law. And you, you read other things and they talk about dispensational and write, people who rightly divide the word and stuff. But the thing is, is... We're not really saying do away with the law. We're saying what? Our relationship to that law has changed. Is there anything wrong with the law? No. The, what, who's the problem with the law? We are and our relationship to it. So when we get into the chapter here, we're going to learn that this chapter really de- deals with our deadness to that old, t- old time past program and principle that's called the law. And this is critical in our daily life, in, in, in our identification issues, because what do we tend to do to each other? What do we tend to do to ourselves? Let's start there. We put us condemned, we put us right back underneath a perform, an external performance-based system. That's the law. Paul says, no, that's not, your, that's not the right program. Romans 6, we learn that we're dead to sin. Look, look, look. Look back over in 6, chapter 6, verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his what? Death. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Newness of life. We have that identification, that co-ness, the co-oneness with his death, burial, and resurrection. Again, newness of life, not renewed, not rehab, not refurbished, brand new, a newness of life. So now in seven, we're going to learn that not only did Jesus Christ died for my sin, took care of the penalty, not only has he died and took care of the power, the dominion of sin over me, but now I've died a new way. I have a new, an, another way to die here, and that's Jesus Christ's death is going to deal with the program of the law. And he's going to set us that manner. So when we come into this, it, it's a, again, the side B to the cross, if you will. Side A, justification, all of that, Romans 1 to 5 forgiveness of sins, and so forth. Side B now, we're talking about our walk, our sanctification, we call it, but our identity, power of sin, taken care of. Now he's going to deal with the, with the, uh, the issues here of the program that we're under, which is law. If you'll notice the verse here, 
in verse 4, the end of that verse, he says that we should bring forth, I'm, I'm sorry, go back up a little more, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth what? Fruit unto God. We're to produce fruit. How do we do that? Well, we're operating not under the law system, but now we're going to operate under the grace system. We don't operate under the law principles. We're now under, operating under the grace principles. So when he says you're dead here, you're dead to a program that is incompatible with how God deals with the believer today, the law. So Paul is going to demonstrate here, by the way, in Romans 7, when we get down into verse 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, that is not an unsaved person's cry. That's a believer's cry. Because Paul is going to demonstrate that he personally tried to operate under the old law program, and guess what he learned that it led to? Frustration. <laughs> it led to absolute failure. And that's going to be a wonderful lesson for us as we go through, because what do we tend to do? We tend to go slide right back underneath there, first ourselves, and then we march it out to others. If you come over to chapter, uh, verse 24, what a wonderful conclusion that Paul gets in verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What a, what a wonderful conclusion, if you will. Why? Because he tried to do it, and guess what it led to? Frustration and failure. Again, you, you, you look there at verse 15, For that which I do I allow not, for what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. Boy, isn't that the case? You just back and forth. Why? Because you're, just, you're not operating under the principles. So as we come into the chapter, a, a brief outline, I gave this a couple, well, three weeks ago now, I guess, as we were looking at the, the new section. The first four verses are going to focus on the positional truth, that declaration of what is true of you and I. What is it? We're dead to the law. Then he starts in verse 5 and runs down to verse 12, and he focuses in on the provision, the description to how it's true, why it's true, why is this the case, what's going on here. And then in verse 13 to 25, he's going to focus on the, byproduct, the product, the application of it all. Here's how it's to look. So you've got position, provision, product. I think I gave you last time declaration, description, and then application. Here's the application of it. Here's what it's designed to look at, look like, and bring you to. So we're going to learn that we're alive in Christ. That's where our source of life is, not in a submitting to an external performance acceptance system that tells us what to do or how to do it, okay? So we're going to learn that as we go through. The great question that usually comes up here is why is Romans 7 even here? Why is it sitting here? Well, go back to chapter 6 and look at verse 14. Let's kind of answer that thought here of why Romans 7, Romans 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. That's what we learned in chapter 6. But why doesn't it have dominion over you? For we're not under the law, but under grace. A great verse, a, a verse we love to use. Usually we don't quote the whole verse. Usually we just say we're not under the law, we're under grace. <laughs> but we miss, that's just a, that's a reasoning for sin shall not have dominion. You know, we have freedom from sin, don't we? But our freedom from sin has nothing to do with our determination, our self-effort, our desires, our emotions to have it be, you know. I hate sin because God hates sin. Okay, that kind of thing. No, our freedom has nothing to do with our capacity 
your capacity to stop sinning. Because guess what? We learned in 6. You can't. God came in and changed your relationship to sin. That spiritual circumcision did all that operating on you. Now, we're, we're, again, we learn that we're free because, not because we are trying to do it ourselves. By the way, when you try to do it yourself, you're, you're putting yourself under the law. Because the law says, do it. Grace says, you can't do it. You see, you see, we're, how are we free from sin? Again, not because we sub, subject ourselves to the law, bec- but because we subject ourselves to those spiritual capacities that are available in grace. So why seven? Well, because he's teaching a, an issue here that you need to understand that the, the law is designed to do to you. Law and grace, two biblical principles. Two principles that are clearly here. Right division sets you free from the confusion of it. Okay? Sets you free from operating under the wrong program. But as we go in through Romans 7, we're going to learn that in order for our deadness to sin and our newness to life to being a living reality, God has made us dead to sin, dead to the law. And he's made us alive under a new program that's called grace. You follow that? All right, let's go have coffee, right? <laughs> no, go back to chapter 7. Okay, sorry, Charlie. See, if you, if you come to church in the rain, you get out early, right? That's what the, <laughs> not really. But uh, chapter 7, look at verse 1. I just want to spend the rest of the time this morning a little bit with you, just looking at the things about the law, things that we're very familiar with, but we have to have them in our mindset as we go through here. Look at verse 1. Know ye not, brethren. Again, there's that know ye not thing. This is a mental thinking. It's a capacity of your, of your mind to think this through. All through chapter 6, know this, know that, know ye not. Reckon this. Think about it this way. Look at it this way. Now, know ye not, brethren. Now, look look at the the parenthesis. For I speak to them that, what? Know the law. So, who are the people of the law? That's a great question. Come back to chapter 2 of Romans. Again, it's something that you'll instantly say, well, Israel is and the Jew is. But, you know, in modern-day Christendom today, there's a great discussion about who this is. See? There's a desire to make you and I spiritual Israel, so guess what happens then? The law belongs to you and I. But that's funny because when I read Romans 2, we've already been through this passage, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a what? A Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of... The law. Who did, God committed the law program to who? To the Jews. Last time I checked, I was not a Jew. Well, come on, Rick. You know, that's not the Mosaic law. That's the spiritual law of the new covenant, don't you know? Well, I do know, but that new covenant doesn't come into his second coming. <laughs> See? What allowed the, the Jews to do verse 18? To know his will and to approve the things that are more excellent. What did God give them? He gave them the law to do that. The Mosaic law was written to one specific people group, the nation of Israel. And uh, this becomes critical as we move forward in Romans 7. And then when you get over in Romans 9, 10, and 11, where Paul talks about the dispensational settings for Israel, because Paul is going to lay out that we are not Israel. We are a what? A new creature. See? We are not a nation. We're a new. We're a body. The law was given to the nation of Israel. We're not, is, we're not replacement Israel. There's your Reformed theology groups. Covenant theology people. We're not... Uh, Reformed Israel, we're not spiritual Israel, we're not Israel at all. 
Actually, if you come over to, oh, you're in Romans, right? Uh, go to Romans 9. Uh, let's just stay in Romans. We'll get down to the other ones here. Romans 9. You see, when, when you begin to talk about the law, it's critical to know who the people of the law are. Romans 9, look at verse 4. Who are Israelites, that's his kinsmen according to the flesh, the end of verse 3. Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the what? The adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law. To whom, who was the law given? The Israelites, see? Not you and I. It was given to the nation of Israel. Come back with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms 147, 147. So when folks try to say, well, you know, you guys are really just spiritual Israel, didn't you, you know? And it's like, wait a minute, no, the verses say what the verses say, and we're not. And there's plenty of verses, ample, we can run all day that demonstrate this. Psalms 147, verse 19 and 20. And by the way, this for us, it, this ought to just be a refresher, if you will, okay? And sometimes, you know, you sit and you listen to stuff and you just go, wow, I know that, but boy, it was so good to hear it again. <laughs> All right, Psalms 147, 19. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. Now, you see why right division is kind of important here? Those two verses are very clear. Who did he give it to? Jacob, Israel. So don't rob Israel. Don't go try to claim the time pass program back here on how the believer is to be operating under back here and bring it over and put it on you and I today and say, you have to be doing it this way. He didn't, it was never his intention. And the reason is, is because what is God doing today? He's creating that new creature. He's creating something, a, a new man. Come back to Galatians 3. Galatians 3. Based solely on the believer being in the Lord Jesus Christ, not all the other stuff. Look at Galatians 3. Galatians 3, look at verse 28. Here's what verse 20, well, 28's the verse, but go back up to verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. There's identity, identification. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's Romans 6, isn't it? Baptized, spiritual baptism, placed into, the, into who? Into the church, the body of Christ. You've put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ... Then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. By the way, what was the promise to Abraham? He was going to have a seed and be the father of many nations. Okay? How was Abraham going to see that? What did God promise Abraham? Resurrection life. Promised him everlasting life. He says, you're going to see it, but right now you're going to go die as an old man. But one day, Hebrews 11 is clear. By faith, Abraham, what? He saw it all afar off, even though he died. He never received it, but he did what? He knew one day he was going to have it. Verse 28, there's neither what? Jew nor Greek. God today does not look at nationalities. That's the Jew and the Greek. Bond or free, that's the economic system. Today we learned Romans 2, there's no respecter of person. You're not going to be able to bribe the judge to get a better deal. Right? You're all what? Sinners. You're all guilty. See? When you put on Christ, he doesn't say one is higher than the other. He says, what are we? Even though we're many members, we're still members of what? One body. See? Diversity, yet unity. We're one. I woke up this morning, a little rain, a lot of rain. 
thunder, lightning, the whole bit. Rolled me out of bed. Well, the dogs rolled me out of bed because <laughs> of the thunder. But my, my foot, I've been having issues with my foot, and it just went, eh, it ain't going to work right now. <laughs> so, whoop, down I went, you know. But the foot, I couldn't tell the foot to do what? Just get out of here. I'm going to cut you off and go, you, you're in the closet, time out. Can't do that, you know. So warmed it up, and off we go, right? The foot didn't say, hey, head, you know, you dummy, what'd you do? He just said he ain't going to work. <laughs> I'm tired. So we're all one. There's no bond or free economic diversity. Male or female, that's a, that, that's a very interesting a male and female. Now, are there males and females? Yes. But we're all what? We're all equal. We have roles and positions. God-ordained roles that we play and positions we're in. But if we're not married or if we're not in those roles, then what are we? You're still members of the body of Christ. No, that's social things. So you've got no nationalities issues. You've got no economic issues. You've got no social biases. Why? Because you're all what? In Christ. Come over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. You see, folks, when you boil, start boiling this stuff down, when, he, when you're in Christ, guess what? There's no law. Why? Because all of those distinctions have been done away with, interrupted, set aside. Colossians 3, look at verse 11. Uh, verse 10, start there, sorry, verse 10. And hath put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Isn't that interesting? The new man is a creation. It's a created thing. It isn't a rehab of the old, refurbish. You know, we're in the antique store, and this is refurbished. You know, it's like, really? Okay, it looked like I just saw that over at Goodwill, you know. <laughs> or at the, actually, the piece I was looking at had a stamp on it from a, from a furniture store that was in business and it just went out of business. I'm like, this is not antique. <laughs> but it just looked, why? Because they had refurbished it. See, it's what? New. Verse 11, where, where there is, where? In the image of him that created him, the renewed in the knowledge, in that new man, in Christ, there's what? neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythians, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Well, there you go, Greek nor Jew again. There's the nationality issue. Then he says circumcision nor uncircumcision. That's a religious connotation. Now you have the social or, or the economic, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. There's your social and economic scenarios again. He says what? All of that has been... Laid down. Come back to Ephesians 2. Here's the doctrine, Ephesians 2. So when we start looking here in chapter 7, the people group is, that the law belongs to is the nation of Israel, not you and I. Uh, Ephesians 2, if you'll start there in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. When he says hath made both one, who's the both? Jew and Gentile. Circumcision, uncircumcision, verse 11. How did he make us both one now? What did he do? He broke down the middle wall of partition. Well, what's that? That's that thing that popped up there in Genesis 17 called circumcision. Middle wall, put up a wall between separated out people. What did he do? He broke it down. First, by the way, first of all, verse 14, he's our what? <laughs> Peace. What did Romans 5, 1 tell us? Being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. He's our peace. We were afar off. We weren't at peace with him. We were at odds with him. Now we're what? Nigh. He's our peace. 
And then he went and did what? He broke down the middle wall of partition, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Look at that. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. By the way, notice the punctuation carefully because these are offset statements. He set them off here. What did he do? He broke down the middle wall of partition. He abolished in his flesh the enmity. There was an enmity that was between uh, every, the groups. There was an enmity between us and him as well. Then he comes in and he contain, he, he does what? He, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, what did, he abolished that. Then, why did he do it? For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, now watch, by the cross, having the slain, the, not at the cross. At the cross would meant right then, 2,000 something years ago. But, but how? By the cross. That's how he's doing this. That's how he did it. What did he do? He said, he said we're not going to have this distinction. If you're in me, we're all one. Okay? Now come back to Exodus 19. So the people group is the group of Israel, is the, is the nation of Israel. Today, God's creating a new creature. So he set aside all of that. He's doing something new. Now, in Exodus 19, I guess point number two or eight or nine or however, is the law principle. Because we're not under the law program. The law wasn't given to us. Nor are we under the law principle. Okay? Exodus 19, verse 3. 19, 3. Well, verse 1, in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they, were in, in, they, they, uh, same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. All right, so who's he going to be talking to? Children of Israel. Where are they? They're in the wilderness. They're up, now they've come up to Mount Sinai, verse 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus, thou sh uh, thus shalt thou say to the house of the world and tell the children of everybody. No? Okay, thank you. Some, one little voice in the whole group. I know it's dark outside still, but come on. <laughs> no, who's he say? He says, hey, to say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Notice what he did. He bare them on eagles' wings. He lifted them up. They're gonna, we're going to read here in a minute. They're to be the head, not the tail. And he, eagles' wings up, protection, over, and brought you unto myself. That's what he did. Now watch verse 5. Now, therefore, here's the principle. If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nations. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded. And all the people answered together and said... All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto God. I'm, I'm sorry, unto the Lord. Isn't that interesting? What did, what did the Lord say? Here's the principle, guys. If, verse 5, I live, look at, you guys saw how I protected you in the wilderness coming out of Egypt, how I protected you? How we did these five tests, run around, and you guys were knuckleheads and didn't learn. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandments, then ye shall be. That is, he, he's setting up a, what kind of relationship are we setting up here? Conditional or unconditional? Conditional. He's, uh, we, these guys have a conditional relationship based upon a performance or a lack of performance. 
And that's the law principle. If you obey me, what am I going to do? I'm going to raise you up and you'll be the envy of all the earth. That's how the law works. The if and the then. A condition, a blessing or a curse based upon performance, obedience. That's a good word. It's a conditional, a, a, a performance-based system to gain acceptance by God. You see, folks, the law is, is based on your ability or lack of <laughs> to perform. So under the law, Israel's relationship, the individual's relationship here of Israel to, to Jehovah, to God, was dependent upon their ability to perform or not to perform. Think about Adam and Eve. In the garden, they got one rule. Look at chapter 20. They're going to get the, they're going to get the ten commandments here. The top ten. These are the ten major categories that all the commandments are going to fit under now. All the 600 plus that they're going to have are going to fit under these top ten. And, and what does he say there in verse 3? Thou shalt have no other gods. Verse 4, thou shalt not. Verse 5, thou shalt not. Verse 7, thou shalt not. Verse 13, thou shalt not. 14, thou shalt not. 15, do, do you think there's a lot of thou shalt nots? <laughs> thou, you're not to do something, or you are to do something. You see, the law says you're going to do this. And you know what grace says? You can't do it. The law says don't do this. You know what grace says? You're always doing it all the time. You know? Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Everybody thinks that's cursing. It's really not. Okay? It's something else in Scripture. But don't take the Lord's name in vain. And yet, what do we say? Gosh darn it. Just kind of a little fib to get around the rule, right? What did Grace said? You've been doing it. You've been doing that all, all the time. See? The law says, don't you do it. Grace says, do it. You can't, you've al you're always doing it. So the law, come over to Deuteronomy 28. The law fundamentally is a performance-based acceptance system. It's external. It's based on activity. And it's an external system that tells us what we are to do and how we are to perform it and what the consequences are for doing it or not doing it. Okay? Paul says, you're dead to this mess, man. i tell you what, it's a great thing to be dead to it. Look at Deuteronomy 28. Look at verse 1. Deuteronomy 28, 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Notice that verse. If thou shalt do all that God has what? Said to do. If thou shalt hearken, notice that word, diligently. Do you know that God demands absolute, unbroken, perfect perfection? That's what he demands. And what does he say? Diligently unto the voice. If you hearken diligently, unbroken. Verse 2. You do it all, verse 1, verse 2, all these blessings shall come on thee and what? Overtake thee. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed, thou, uh, blessed shalt thou be in the city and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and, and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in and blessed 
shalt thou be when thou goest out. Look at all of that. Blessings are going to come in, and what are they going to do? They're going to overtake you. They're going to overwhelm you. They're going to drown you in blessing. Over there in Malachi 3, when he says, try me, bring up what you're supposed to do, and I'll put more stuff in the barn than you know what to do with. And you go back in through and you study some of this out, and the guys that are out there, they're reaping, they're harvesting the field, and they're putting it in the barns, and as soon as they get done, it's time to harvest again. So they're out there building more barns, and they got a more and more. And he says, that's what is to do if you do what? If you hearken and you do what I ask you to do. All the way down, verse 4 to down, look, look, look at verse 7. The Lord will cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten. Military power. 7, verse 8, 9, 10. When all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Military power. Verse 11. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, and the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open thee his good treasure. You know what? You're going to have economic prosperity. Back up in, there in verse 4 and so forth and 5. Family prosperity. Anytime you ever read about a famine going on in the land, it's not always famine of food and water. There's famine of kids and all this stuff. Why? Because they're not hearkening. Verse 15. Well, verse 13. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to... Do them. Isn't that interesting? Then he says, And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Folks, they had to have the word of God. And they had the word of God. Because they weren't, that's what told them to do what? What to do, what not to do, how to do it, what, you know. Hey, on the fifth, eighth, on the fifth Tuesday of the third month, you got to do, you know, all this stuff. It's like, holy cow. Okay, there isn't a fifth Tuesday on the third month. Okay, just <laughs> everybody's looking at me, huh? You know, but that's what it is. What did he, what did he, uh, the, pop, the guy in the Popeye, I'll gladly pay you for a hamburger on next Tuesday for a burger today or something like that. That's kind of the idea. Look at verse 15. But it, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Notice the word diligently is gone. It's not listed there. Isn't that interesting? To observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Uh-oh, is right. This is the passage that, that modern-day Christendom uses to say that when you're in trouble, it's because you're not doing, you have, you have no faith, little faith, and so forth. And they come to this kind of idea. Because what's happening? Well, you're going to be cursed in the city. Verse 18, the, you're going to have, uh, uh, curse shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, uh, increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke. Ouch. And all thou... thou Settest thine hand unto for to do until thou be what? Destroyed. And until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me. It's, the curses are designed to do what to them? Destroy them. Verse 24 The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be. What? Destroy. Hey, the rain, you're going to have floods, you're going to have weather problems. Verse 25, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. We're going to have a military defeat. Verse 27, the Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt and with the emrods em and with the scab and with the itch. <laughs> Wherefore thou canst not be what? Healed. No physical healing. I love that, the scab, the itch. 
the botch. <laughs> it's like, ooh, sounds so lovely, don't they? <laughs> you know? Verse 28, the Lord shall smite thee with madness and with blindness and astonishment. You see, madness, mental illness, it's going to get you. You're going to go mad. Verse 30, thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt bind a house, or build a, bind a house. Build a house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes. Family problems. You're going to lose your family, your home, your land. 31 down there, to, you know, verse 32, you're going to lose all your possessions. Verse 35, the Lord shall smite thee in the knee and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot under the top of thy head. <laughs> there you go. That's why you're falling apart. You're not keeping the law. You're not doing. Where's your tithe? <laughs> you know, and off they run. If I do, the law says if you do it, you'll have blessings, overwhelming blessings. And if you don't, you're going to have overwhelming curses and punishment. Come back to Romans 7. You're going to have trouble. Now, the question that I always have when people try to run us back underneath the law is, is that the kind of relationship we want to have with God, our spouses, our children, our co-workers, our extended families? Do you want to have that kind of a relationship? I don't. No, thank you. <laughs> you know? In Romans 7, you know what he's going to say? Verse 4, ye also are become, what? Dead to the law. Our relationship to the law is one of deadness. Just as that guy lays in the coffin and he's dead, there's no interaction to it. And why it's critically important here is because our relationship with God is not going to be based on our ability to or not to perform. Rather, it's going to be based upon an unconditional free gift unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, unconditional forgiveness, nothing to do with our performance. All to do but based on His grace. I got a little list here. The law says, do it to get. Grace says, you already have everything. The law says, behave. You know what grace says? Believe. The law says, there's a work to do. Grace says, there's a walk to have. The law says, the law is an external system. Externally. Grace is an eternal system. The law focuses on the outward actions Grace focuses on the internal awareness. The law says nothing but activ accepts nothing but activity. Grace accepts nothing. I'm sorry. Law says not activity. Grace says acceptance. The law says stop. Stop in the name of the law. You know what grace says? Stand. Just stand. The law says, retribution is coming your way. You know what grace says? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Grace can, you know, the law says, you got a debt, pay it. You know what grace says? Grace can never incur a debt. Grace will never allow a repayment. You can't pay God back for what he did. <laughs> Why? Because what he did isn't based on your activity. Grace never treats a person as he deserves. Grace, uh, let me start that one again. 
because I this one is a quote, so let's get it right. Grace never treats a person as he deserves, nor better than he deserves, but rather treats a person without regard to what he deserves. See, the law is Deuteronomy 28. If you do it, I'll... If you obey, you know what you deserve? Blessings. If you disobey, you know what you deserve? Curses. Grace says, I'm going to come in and treat you in such a way that I won't ever bring up what you deserve, but will extend unmerited favor regardless of what you truly deserve. <laughs> We call that mercy. That's what we call it. So when we come back here to Romans 7, it's critical to have Romans 7 sit where Romans 7 sits. Because it's in, and, and sits where it sits in our edification process because what are we doing? We're learning. We're growing. Because the natural reaction will be to do what? Just as our natural reaction is to live under sin and do some things that we're not supposed to be doing. Our natural reaction then is to say what? Lord, give me something to do. Preacher, give me something to do and I can do it. Lord, if you just give me some, let me help you. Let me repay you, Lord. Let me, let me pay you back for all that you've given me. And all you do is attack the grace of God when you do that. You frustrate it, as he tells the Galatians. Or you can fall from it, as he also tells the Galatians. So then the thing, of the, the thing that kind of throws up at it, you're in Romans 7. Look down at verse 12. If you're not in Romans 7, get to Romans 7. The thing that gets thrown back up to us is that when, when you say you don't keep the law and so forth, then you are blaspheming the law, okay? You're making the law be something it's not. Well, look at Romans 7. Look at verse 12. What do we learn about the law? Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. What do we learn about the law system? It's a what? It's a perfect system, isn't it? That reveals and manifests the character and the attitude and the traits of a holy, righteous, just God. But what else do we learn? That it isn't the law that's the problem. Who's the problem? We are. That's what we learn in 7. Verse 13, was then that which is good made death unto me. God forbid, but sin. Isn't that interesting? That it may appear sin working death in me, that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sin. Boy, could you imagine sin being exceeding sinful? That's pretty bad. For what, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. We'll look down at all of that next time, coming weeks. What do we learn about the law? The law is holy. Just, we're not blaspheming the law. We have nothing against the law. Do you know that the law commandments were given to Adam and Eve in the garden? He was teaching them the principles of the law. You go study that stuff out and you look over in Galatians and he says the law was added to because of what? The transgressions. See? The law was taught to Adam, Noah, Abraham. It was given to him because what is it? It's holy, it's just, it's right, it's good. Adam and Eve had one commandment in the law, in, in the garden. Don't eat of that tree. They knew all about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They knew where it was. And you know what? It was a beautiful tree. And Paul's going to say, if you offend in one, you're what? Guilty of all of you. Galatians, James, quoting James. James says it. We don't, we're not against the law. We just learned something about the law. Back up, look back up at verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. 
But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. See, the prob- we understand the problem with the law isn't the law. It's the people. It's the sinner. And we're going to learn that the law doesn't stop sin in our lives. It won't. It can't. That's that thing there about the motions of sin, which were what? By the law. You know why? Because what the law says, do this. The law says, when you do that, do this. It doesn't stop it. It doesn't communicate how to stop it. But rather, we've been delivered from the law because what are we? We're dead to it. Our relationship to it is we should serve in the newness of spirit. Notice, newness. Not rehab, not refab, not refurbished. Newness against the old letter of the law. What was, you know what the old letter of the law was? Thou shalt not. That's the letter. No longer we'd operate on the thou shalt, but rather we're to operate in this newness. And if you do, and you're under the law, you know what you're going to do? You're just going to get frustrated. And down in this passage, in chapter 7, 47 times, if I counted right, Paul will say, I, me, my, as he goes through that frustration down to verse 24, 7, 13 down to 24, right in there, where he says, O wretched man, that is Paul's conclusion, that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of... You know what Paul says? The answer to the law is a person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not in me doing. It's not in me functioning. And he's, we're going to learn, I hope, <laughs> to enjoy our position in Christ because we're under the right program. We're playing by the right rules, if you will. Okay? I'll be honest with you, folks. You read this passage. Paul made the mistake of trying to do it and operate and function under the law, and he got frustrated. So if Paul can make that mistake, guess what? You and I can make it too. And you know what's going to happen? Same thing. So we need to be careful about it. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the study of it, for the folks that are interested in that. In your name we pray. Amen.